this is a chain of beads, and this is a uh, glass. Now, if I was to drop the chain of beads, what will happen? It will fall. Yes, that's right, it'll fall because of gravity, but watch this. This side goes up. Why? Because of gravity. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Why does one side go up because of gravity? Well, it gets a little complicated, but I can explain. Um, but I think I should, I'll have to put the beads back in the glass. Okay, so what's going on? Well, when this part of the chain starts falling out, it gets longer and longer, and it has more mass than this side of the chain. And if it has more mass, then it has more inertia. And when it starts yanking out very hard, this side of the chain gets yanked up out of the glass very quickly. And when it gets yanked up hard, it flies into the air. But then, of course, the direction has to change, so it goes around a curve and then goes back down. Because of the speed that it's going, that curve starts lifting up over the top of the glass. And that's how it works. There's a big difference in energy because this chain falls far. I try it from here, and it doesn't work as well. Why? Because the drop from here to here isn't as big. You want lots of force acting on the falling chain, which means the higher you do it from, the better it works. So maybe we should max it out. Yeah. Oh, wait, we should wait for it to stop. And now let's max it out. This is a really long chain, and this is a really long drop. Let's see what happens. Whoa! <laughs> Look at that! Whoa! Super maxed out! Science! This is a pendulum. It's a weight that swings. It swings back and forth. Pendulums are pretty simple. It, it swings back and forth. Predicting the path of a pendulum? Pretty simple. It's gonna swing back and forth. But wait! as I make it so much more complex by adding a pendulum. Now I've got a pendulum down here, and that one swings back and forth, and I've got a pendulum up here that swings back and forth. What will happen to this part of the pendulum when I let it go? Can you predict? Let's find out. This is a double pendulum, and predicting the path of a double pendulum is really difficult. It's still simple physics, but because there's a moving part attached to a moving part, it makes it way more complex. So, the question is, can we max it out even more? Of course we can. These are chaos pendulums. This one's a lever, and it's got another lever on the end. Whoa, and this one here is a perfectly balanced lever, and it's got a pendulum on either side. Whoa. <laughs> Scientists and engineers have always said that the more moving parts something has, the more complex they are. Science. Come on down to Sal's Science Shop. I am Sal, and this is my science shop. You want levers? I got the best levers around. Little levers, big levers, all drastically reduced. If you can find a lever anywhere else for less, then you gotta tell me, because I didn't know anybody else was selling them. Come on down to South Science Shop, your one-stop shop for science. Hey, you want some levers? Well, boom, have I got levers. What class would you like? What's that? You didn't know that levers have different classes? Well, there are three different classes of levers. First class, business class, and coach. <laughs> no, first class, second class, Third class, it's pretty straightforward. And what do we need when we have a lever? We need a load, we need a fulcrum, and we need a lever. Ha <laughs> ha, first class lever, the fanciest of levers. You got your load on this end, you got your fulcrum right here underneath, and then you put some effort into this end, and wow, look how easy that is, ha <laughs> ha. First class. What kind of thing works like that? I don't know, how about this trebuchet you've been spending all this time watching? First class lever, right there in front of you. Second class lever. Look, there's a load right here in the middle, the fulcrum's on this end, and you put your effort in at this end, and you lift it, and look, it's a second class lever. Huh? How cute is that? 
know what kind of thing works like that. It's like a wheelbarrow. The fulcrum is the wheel. The load goes in this. I guess this is the barrow. And then I lift with the handles. Huh? Look at that. Ha! Lever. Third class lever. You got your load on this end. You got your fulcrum on this end. But where is the effort? The effort's in the middle. And it pivots while you move it. Huh? Huh? Where are you gonna get that kind of crazy contraption? Salad tongs. Salad tongs? Salad tongs. Look, you put the effort in, in the middle there. It pivots on that end. And you have the load there. And there you go. First class, second class, and third class levers. Whatever your mood, we've got the levers for you. Mmm, a delicious plate of cheese and crackers, my favorite snack. But these crackers are pretty salty, so I should probably pour myself a glass of water first, huh? Yeah, well, no! Why? Why does this happen? Why does the water stick to the glass? Well, because of science. And the reason why it happens gets a little complicated, but it boils down to this one simple thing. Water likes to stick to things. Huh? huh? Did you see? Did you see how it stuck? No, of course you didn't. You know why? Because it only sticks on a small scale. See those drops of water? That's water sticking to the surface. But it only works when the surface tension of the water is less than the force of gravity, which is why water drops fall when they get bigger. So it sticks to things. That still doesn't explain why you can pour water out of some containers without any drips, and other containers make it nearly impossible. <laughs> It's all about the angle. Water will flow very easily when there isn't a large change in direction, like around the curved top of this glass. But when there's a big change in direction, like at the mouth of this teapot, the water can't make that turn as easily. This is also why pouring from a full glass is much messier than one that's less full. Pouring out of a full glass, the water only needs to change direction this much to flow down the side. But from a half full glass, the water would need to change direction this much. So all this happens because water likes to stick to things. So let's do an experiment and coat this glass with hydrophobic spray. Now, hydrophobic coatings repel water. So if it's repelling the water from the outside of the glass, will we still have the same problem? Well, let's find out. Hydrophobic coated glass, non-hydrophobic coated glass, or just regular glass. Water likes to stick to surfaces, but it can't stick to one coated in hydrophobic coating. That's impressive. Should we try something else? Well, that's one way to solve the dribbling glass problem. Except you can't coat your glasses at home with hydrophobic coating because it's not good to eat. The secret is using a container that has a very sharp angle between where you're pouring the water and the underside of the glass, like this jug. And there you go. Now I can enjoy a nice glass of water with my cheese and crackers. Uh, oh, right, I am. Um, wait, hold on, I can re, I will remake the crackers into, see, look, see, it's just, it's fine. It's fine, I'm not really gonna eat that, I'm just kidding. Silita and I are maxing out our spinning top. Based on our small version, we decided to make one with as much mass as possible. So we got a 20 kilogram weight and welded it to a metal shaft. Will this work the same way? Well, let's look at the science. Why does a top spin? Well, let's start with Newton's first law, which is an object at rest tends to stay at rest, an object in motion tends to stay in motion. But the in motion has another part. That object also wants to go in a straight line. If you think of a bowling ball rolling along, it would need another force to act upon it to make it change direction. We say that a moving object has momentum. Now, a top doesn't go in a straight line, it spins around, but it still has momentum. It's an object in motion. And even though it's spinning, it still does want to go in a straight line. It's just that that straight line is here. We call this angular momentum. To make a top move this way or that way would take an outside force. So it stays upright as long as it has enough momentum. But when it slows down, there's less momentum and it becomes harder to resist external forces like gravity, which will eventually want to make it topple. Our top has a lot of mass, which means it'll have a lot of angular momentum when it gets spinning. It's just a matter of getting it spinning fast enough. So should we spin it? Yeah, let's spin it. Let's see if we can get it to work. Hey! 
Spin, 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 spin. Are we Lego? In three? Wait, wait, wait. I can't get What? Go! Oh. Um, wait, wait. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, uh, Not fast enough. We need something to help us get it spinning faster. faster. Maybe a rope? A rope, yeah. Should grab a rope. That was my like idea, too, a rope, because the small one uses a rope. Yes. Okay. Okay, I'll go grab a rope. So, wrapping the rope up. I'll let you wrap the rope okay. up. I'll get my holder back on top. Spin it counterclockwise. We attach the rope and wind it up. You want to make it super clean. This is some of the best coiled rope I've ever seen. I'm going to pull the rope. You're going to hold on to it, but I can't okay. pull really hard because you won't be able to hold it up. Because yeah. we don't have to pull hard, we just have to get it going fast. Yes. Silita keeps her hand on the block at the top, and I pull. Ready? Wait a minute, we'll get all the way. Oh. Whoa! It's spinning a lot better than I thought it would. <laughs> it's still spinning, but it's wobbling. Uh oh, careful. Oh, there it goes. It works, but just barely. It might spin better, it might spin straighter. Yeah. If we had it spinning, something help us spin it faster. Yes. Um, faster with more power. Faster with more power. Hmm. <laughs>